It's not in the middle of January, though. Harold, great to have you. Love seeing it. Karen, you want to intro our good friends that we have here with us today? Sure. I think we have intro slides, but you guys can see the agenda. So we have two special guests with us and um, Paul will start first and we'll tell you a little more about each one, like right before I think their presentations, uh, but you can see here the agenda and we'll, um, are we wrapping up at close to three today, Nelson? No, I think we, we got a, a two in here, but read those as, uh, read those as ones. That was that's, oh, okay. Uh, no problem. That's okay. Atlantic in the middle of the ocean time, right there. No, nope. <laughs> that's totally cool. I okay. think that might have been me. I think that might have. This is Brazilian time. I, think I did that. <laughs> well, that's right. No, no problem. Um, and on the next slide, I believe we've got a look at our calendar. So for those of you who may be a little newer, um, go check out if you if you search on Tableau Public, a tug or Atlanta Tableau User Group, you can find this calendar. It's out on Tableau Public, and it stays. Um, it's automated, connected to a Google spreadsheet with all of our upcoming meetings and information about those meetings. So our next meeting is planned for July 15th, and we have two special guests, big guests in the Tableau community, and Will's going to speak, be speaking about um, date calculations, and Zach is going to talk with us about giving us some design tips. Tableau design tips and tricks. So those are always great meetings. So encourage you guys to come if you can in July and in August. We don't have anything on this particular slide, but August 19th meeting will be a joint meeting with Raleigh Tug and Tucson. So another big group, um, which is always kind of fun when everyone gets together and there's a bunch of people in the chat. Yeah, the, uh, the, the infamous uh what was it matt what do we call that the super tug from a couple yes. <laughs> uh, times ago this will this will be like the grandchild of that exactly Smaller, uh but still in the same dna <clears throat> <laughs> yeah and just just to give everyone a heads up in case uh, many of you have probably already heard about this but iron viz this is iron viz season so do any of you guys know what is the date is it fourth of july that that's the deadline. Do y'all know? I don't know. I believe it might be 4th of July, but I, it's probably on some of these next few slides. But if you've been to Tableau Conference before, you are aware of Iron Viz. It's like the biggest data viz competition. It's super fun to watch in person. And unfortunately, this is going to be another year where it'll be virtual. Um, but it's still on and it's still like a really great chance to even if you're participating and you know maybe newer to Tableau or unsure of your skills or whatever, just doing it, just getting that practice, like you'd be surprised, like how much like you'll learn and grow and how um, how friendly and like welcoming the community is to really giving you feedback and like praise and encouragement and everything. So here's a little more that you see up here about Iron Viz and like all the prizes. Um, Anyway, I just wanted to plug this because you still have a few weeks. You can use any data set. Um, I think there might be one more slide, but right. the theme is pretty broad and it's all about like build a viz about what like what gives you joy. Anything, what do you enjoy? And you that that could really be it just opens up. There's so many topics. Um, so if you can create a data set or find a data set, it's it's like open you know you can you can use it so um if anybody is like has any questions or wants to share what they're working on or get feedback uh that might be a good use case for like our atug slack yeah there you go and i saw uh one of the twins uh has already created uh, their submission and it was iron viz that bought that brought them joy and so they did a whole viz on iron viz which i actually appreciated a great deal because i've been to i've been to now seven or eight tableau conferences and i've been to every time i've been to a tableau conference i've gone to iron viz mm -hmm. um, my first one was back when ryan sleeper won it uh in 2013 um but yeah so it's always a, a great event and you actually have until uh 2 59 a.m eastern on <laughs> July 3rd, because that is at an 11.59 p.m. on July 2nd, Pacific. So the advantage that we now have because of 
significant. I mean, guys, you have to enter. Like, you heard him, you know? You got an extra two hours. Lay up. Come on, like, think of what you can get done. <laughs> I just think it's unfortunate. I mean, everybody, you know, in England and so forth, I mean, like, they're going to know who won even before we go to sleep. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be nuts. So, anyway, uh, this is awesome. Definitely encourage everybody to join and jump in. All right. With that, uh, I think it is both my duty, honor, and privilege to introduce our dear friend, uh, Paul Lisborg. Uh, Paul is a former leader of the Atlanta Tableau User Group, um, and handed the reins over to Karen and I and Anna uh, when he transitioned over to Tableau, and, and he is now a Principal Customer Success Manager uh, at Tableau, uh, and you can just read that as Rockstar. Um, and so we're excited, Paul, to have you here. Um, you're going to talk about some cool stuff, particularly focusing on map layers. So, my man. Uh, Absolutely. Start- Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to pop my screen here and make sure this is working properly and share and just double check to make sure everyone can see that. We got you. Got it. Okay. Am I sharing the Tableau one or am I sharing the... It's the Tableau. Oh, it is. Okay, good, good, good. I am also going to, if you don't mind, just stop my video so I don't feel I'm looking in one direction and and talking to you and from another. So you can see you can see my Tableau screen. That is a good thing. So thank you again, um, both Nelson, Karen, Anna, and and my wife Jennifer for having me. Um, present today. Always good to come back to the Atlanta community um, and 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 present at, at, at ATUG. It really, I have a long history um, with it, which I'll give you a, a little brief overview. But um, first, a little bit um, about me. Um, I started Tableau, using Tableau in 2009, was introduced to Tableau by a future Zen master, um, Dan Murray. And um, just absolutely became to, to love it just fine. So um, in addition to that, in 2009 was, was also um, part of the very first Atlanta Tableau users group. Um, these are just some pictures of me and my wife, Jen, my daughter, Emma, um, and Nathan, taken a while back before COVID, obviously, um, and while we were at Disney World. Um, this is me at one of my many, I think I have attended, I can't remember if it's 11 or 12 um, consecutive Tableau conferences, always learn something new, even, even as, a, um, as a Tableau employee um, now, I'm always learning about Tableau and, and learning um, really the use cases that, that customers share with me. And it's always a pleasure to, um, to go to those conferences. So I would encourage you, if you haven't been even to the, um, to the virtual one, those are, are put on very, uh, you know, obviously it's not like meeting people in, in person, um, but it's the next best thing. Um, this is this is really where the community, the Atlanta Tableau Users Group, has has come. We started back in, I want to say, October, November, two thousand and nine. There were thirty two of us, and right there you can see a little bit thinner version of Paul. Um, but there were thirty two um, of us that that started that, and it has really, really swelled. Um, we celebrated. Um, our 10th anniversary, what, about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, and that's kind of a picture, not even a full picture of, of everybody was there, um, but it has really swelled. And I can't say enough of um, both to the current lo- leaders and the, the leaders that preceded us, um, just what a great job um, um, they've done with the Atlanta Tableau Users Group. And, and I would encourage you, if you if you're you know not a member, if you're not subscribing to the emails, do so. Um, you want to be here every month to find out what um, what new is going on. And really, hopefully, um, as we head into the fall, maybe we'll even be able to cut, get out of the the virtual um, and into um, into meeting face to face, which would be great. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about map layers, which I absolutely love. It was introduced um, with Tableau 2020.4. If you don't have it, download it um, and and play around with it because it is it really has opened up um, a lot of of 
of functionality with mapping, which of course Tableau does so easily out of the box, um, right out of the gate. But but there was an issue, and and that is if you had different levels of granularity um, and you wanted to map them, say both on the county um, and the zip code level, then you had to do a little bit of um, either a dual axis or you had to um, play around with perhaps something like map box or create a customized map to show those lift different levels of granularity. And that's what I'm gonna show you today. It's really based on a simple premise. Um, and and this, this was a, an actual use case. Um, and that was to identify locations for future manufacturing sites or distribution sites um, where our customers are but our competitors are not and that was um that became known as project white space for an organization i was working with um, prior joining to tableau and you can see just so you that i'm not blowing smoke i actually went in and 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 um and looked at salesforce because i can remember being um a part of a, a small part of this um this case where we were basically it says combine geographic information from two files. Well, that sounded easy enough. However, when I tried it way back in 2016, we ended up having to, um, to use Mapbox to, to create the mapping layers. We couldn't really perform what we wanted to do in Tableau. And that's what I'm gonna show you how map layers now with the introduction of map layers in 2020.4 has really, um, really helped. So with that, um, I always love to um, present in Tableau. We were talking a little bit about that um, before we started today, rather than PowerPoint, so that you can see that, you know, exactly what we're doing. And, and I'm gonna start with a very easy premise. This is US Industries. This is the company that 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 you can say that we're running. Um, and we have two distribution facilities. We have one out here in Beaumont, Texas, and down here in Victoria, Texas. And once again, this is real easy to do with, with Tableau, no really, no matter what version you're on. Um, and it's just geocoded down to the city. So I know that our, we have a plant here in Victoria, have a plant here in Beaumont, and I just pulled in, um, created a, a little data set that showed those two facilities. Well, our aspirations are to grow in Texas. Actually, our aspirations are to grow beyond Texas, but, but we're going to use Texas as the example. And I know where my competitors are as well. And my competitors happens to be THM Corp. And so here I am, or here we are in Beaumont and Victoria, and my competitors are in blue. Once again, this is geocoded down to really the city level. Um, and so there's just one distribution facility um, within each city. Now you can see here that um, probably when I was choosing locations or as we were choosing locations for our distribution facility, we we're kind of in the, 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 the extreme Southeast portion of Texas. And although sales are going pretty well, um, we're not really um, positioned to push up into Amarillo or even out um, in, in the extreme southwest part of, of Texas. So how, how can we analyze this and, and what can we do um, to, to see how we can visualize this so that if we need to create a plant, we need to add um, additional um, production capabilities. How do we do that? And this was a real use case, like I said, back all the way back in 2018. So you kind of see I gave them names, U.S. Industries um, and THM. And really, this is a classic case of us versus them, U.S. Industries versus THM. So with that, I'm going to pull in, once again, an, something that an organization would have, which is their, our sales. What are the sales for um, for U.S. industries, because I want to see that um, in relationship to this map. And so all I'm going to do is take postal code 
and I'm going to drag it in. And when you when I drag it in with anything greater than 2020.4, you're going to see this something called an atom marks layer. And so I drop that in, and lo and behold, I now have what really is, if, if I were to do this with a dual axis map, I have now locations here of every zip code. And you can see now I have two, two cards here within the marks card. And one is for zip code. The other one is for my original state. So now I, ha I, can, I, can, I can utilize this just as if I had a dual access. If I have um, my sales, I can pull my sales in here to size. It's going to size those, um, those, you know, those um, bubbles. And I can do the same thing that I've always done. I'm going to kind of make it a little bit big because it's, um, because it's money, monetary. Um, I can kind of show now my sales out here at 79907 is about $13,000. And I might even want to take the color and diminish the color a little bit and then put a border on it. Just everything that we would normally have done um, you know, with 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 a, a bubble map of, of this type. The only problem now is that, for instance, here in San um, San Antonio, my bubble covers the um, the distribution facility of one of my competitors. Well, no worries. I can take this and I can drag it so that my distribution facilities show first. So now I have my um, my my competitors, myself and my competitors on top of the layer, and I have my bubbles underneath showing the um, showing my my sales. So that's one portion of it. But I want to add even more granularity to this. And when I was working on this, oh, I think I was um, set to to introduce this early um, earlier in the year. Um, I came across. Um, kind of a, really, it was kind of exciting, but a little disturbing at the, at the same time, um, a McKinsey article that came out February 3rd, um, 2021, which was saying, talking about harnessing the power of external data. And what it, what the, this article, I think it's seven or eight pages, and you can, you can download it, just search harnessing the power of external data. But what it goes on to talk about is that comparatively few have realized the full potential of linking internal data with data that is provided by third parties, such as US Census, perhaps weather data. And this kind of shook me to my core because, and I'll ask Nelson, how long have you been connecting to external data? I, I know you did something, um, you did something several years ago where you were connecting to weather data, which caused me to want to connect to weather data. Um, but we've been doing this for what, close to a decade, right? Yeah, honestly, Paul's an interesting question. Could you make me reflect the, the very, very first thing I ever did in data visualization, even before I got into Tableau, I was, I was doing some stuff in Google Earth and I had a little Java stuff that was popping up in the, the little tooltip thing. And it was um, like live video. And those were like URLs that had like little embeds to live video. And that was like a, you know, for a public service and so forth. And so, yeah, it, your question's a great one because it, it makes me go back to some really interesting use cases for, for grabbing external data. And in that case, that was like video and pictures and stuff like that, but it's still external because it wasn't something that we were hosting ourselves. So yeah, yeah, yeah. really good question. <clears throat> so if the best, you know, and, and, and the, the best thing about a lot of this external data is that if it's provided by the government, typically it's free. Um, and, and even with, with, with the non-free data, I know with the weather data um, that I was connecting to, it was, it was fractions of a penny for every data point that you wanted for a specific location. So it was very, very reasonable. Um, and so I say that to say that Tableau has had this ability to do this um, for, for, for more than a decade. However, we're gonna play around with it just a little bit. So here on my back, I'm back at my mat with, with both where my locations are, where my sales are, where my competitors are. Well, next, I wanna take that, some of that external data and I wanna pull it into 
um, I want to pull it into my visualization. Now, keep in mind the the sales is by postcode, postal code, but this I'm going to pull in by county. And so I'm just going to take county here in my marketing stats, and I'm going to pull that once again into layers. And once again, I'm going to get a dot for every um, for every county within Texas. Now, there is an interesting phenomena, and I'm going to ask, and nobody knew I was going to do this. Um, so I guess, does everybody have, um, I guess they have um, access to either the chat or the Q&A. Is that right, Jen? That's right. Everybody, Okay. So I'm going to ask, and for the first right question, I'm going to award $50 gift certificate of to Tableau Swag Store. Why am I getting 101 un and by the way, Nelson, you're not um, you're not eligible, so it has to be a non Tableau leader. Um, why am I getting 101 unknown geographic locations when I pull county in to Texas? And Jen, have we had any answers yet? We have a few. Okay. Yeah, some answers in the chat. Let's just, let's just see. Uh, I think Jesse has the right one. Jesse, can we make sure? What, let's see. I, I'm, I'm see, my, my other those, screen is those, too small. Those, oh. those, count, those counties also exist in other states. That is exactly right. Jesse Rader, is that right? I, I hope mm -hmm. we're pronouncing your name right. That is... You are dead on correct. So there's a number of ways or to that that you can you can you know can counter this obviously, but but you're exactly right. I can go in and just click on that 101 unknown. Click on edit location. So you can see. Hey, wait a minute. The matching location is ambiguous. And when you look at Brown County, how many Brown counties are there in? Um, you know, in the U.S., probably each state has a, a, a Brown or a Calhoun County. And so all I have to do is say, well, what, what do I want to use? And I can use this from the state field. And so now it says, okay, I know that you're Brown County from Texas, and I can, I can associate the county correctly. So that's exactly right. Be looking for an email directly from me um, from for your Tableau swag. So there's a couple things here I want to do. Once again, I've got it um, here in the marks card. I'm going to change this to a field map. Okay. I then want to take median household income and pull it into color. Want to change the colors a little bit. I'm going to just make this kind of the hot and the traditional hot and cold reverse here, apply, go, and maybe maybe drown the color a little bit so it's not quite so um, so overbearing. And so now I see, hmm, loving Texas. That's a pretty good side. That's an eighty eighty thousand dollars of median household income up here in the extreme um, Hartley, Texas. I can see. So once again, I have both city data, postal data, and now I have county data on here. And once again, I want these marks, this particular mark to kind of live behind everything. So I can still hover over my, my, my facilities, my competitors, my sales. And now I have, um, you know, where I can target locations. Now you can see real, I'm actually doing pretty well because down here in Victoria, I have ac already have access to these counties. It's really up here in the extreme northern portion and the north, um, more of the western counties that I don't have access to because I'm, I'm, I've got distribution facilities way out here in the, in the southeast. And this, once again, was a real use case that um, that, that we really didn't have a good answer for other than we had to build each one of these layers in map box. And now you can do it right out of the gate um, using map layers. But there's one additional thing that I wanna show. And this has to do with some of our buffer calculations. And it's the ability to, um, and we always had this ability, but you had, had to, um, write some pretty complicated 
um, um, code and calculations to accomplish this. But now we've made it possible to allow you to look at, um, at, at, at ranges and with these buffer calculations. So let me show you the buffer calculation here first. And basically it's going to use some lat long and I get to using a parameter, I get to dynamically say, well, all right, out of the new cities that I'm considering locating an additional facility, how many miles, what's the radius that I want to use to, to, to de design a plot to put a mark on, um, on my map. And this is a, an extremely easy, all you're doing is a make point and then you're, you're, um, you're enclosing it in a buffer calculation. And all you need is a lat long for where you're looking. So now I'm actually going to have marks based on city, zip code, um, um, county, and now down to the, to really the most granular, which is latitude and longitude. And then you can see here, I'm just going to take my, this now, this geometry calculation. And once again, I'm going to drop it right into the marks layer. And these are the, these are the sites that I am considering um, locating. And the beauty of this is because I used a parameter, I can change the buffer size from 20 miles to 40 miles. I think I've got it going up to 100 miles. Um, but I can automatically adjust this with just that one calculation and um, combine that with a with a um, buffer um, with a with with a parameter. I'm able to dynamically change this. Now there was and is still a problem with this because when I see something like this, I, I don't know, I guess I could look over here and say, oh, I'm at 40 miles. Um, but I wanted to originally take my buffer size parameter and pull it in into my label. And son of a gun, it just does not work. And I haven't gotten with um, with 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 the Tableau dev team to make sure if, if, if that is something by design, um, that they decided not to allow you just to drop that that um, that really it's just a, a numeric version of 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 the buffer size in. But I got to thinking about it for just a second. I go, well, I know I can drop other things in. I can drop a calculated field. So all I did was create a calculation based on my parameter, and now I can pull him in to label. Which once again. This is tr this the, the 40 the 40 miles here is being dropped right in the center of all these. So how would I get 40 miles um, on each of my on each of my um, circles? And the we the way that I do that is I can just take state, put it here into drag it into detail, and now I have each one of these, I can go in here and change my label. So be a little bit more readable to say in miles and click apply and click okay. And so now I can take and size these and I can understand exactly what, um, what that radius is as I drag it out. So that is really a very simple, um, but powerful, compelling, um, use case that that actually I ran up against in 2018. It has been solved. Um, no longer do you need to, to create, you know, um, customized layers underneath to put all this. You have all of this at your fingertip and you can then um, judge in this case, where would be the best place to add a new distribution facility. So with that, I'm gonna, I, I guess we can take maybe a couple of Q and A um, if got, not, we've go got ahead. one for you, Paul. Okie dokie. Let's okay, hear them. So we got Chris has asked if there's any integration between Tableau and ArcGIS. I, I believe there is. Nelson, I don't have, um, I have not done that personally. Have you come across um, yes, a, a direct? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, a couple of different things you can say there. There are, if when you think about ArcGIS, a lot of times that uh, materializes itself in shapefiles. And so shapefile is kind of that spatial file that Paul's got uh, right there. So, you know, if you have that kind of dot uh, SPH or whatever it is, file. There we go. So right here, right there. 
And then so, the server is the other one that is is really valuable, um, is being able to connect to those sources that are on the server. So yeah. Excellent question. But there's Esri ArcGIS right there. So it does connect. I've not personally done that. And to be honest, um, I think we have now native, maybe 80 connectors right out of the box. And of course, there are all types of other connectors um, that are out there. So if you can get it into a shape file, um, you'll be able to get it. Um, you'll be able to get it into Tableau. Paul, one thing that's kind of cool here too is like if you have geospatial data coming from a bunch of places like Esri and other stuff, you, you can point it all to Mapbox and then use the Mapbox map to be kind of the layer that has some of those things in it. Now you lose some of the interactivity in it. Um, but if, if, if the whole goal is just like I got data, like geospatial data from a bunch of sources, Mapbox can be helpful there too. So it just depends on if it's, if it's, uh, Esri and other things that Tableau doesn't natively connect to, Mapbox can be a good landing space for it. All right, great question. Um, do we have anything else or do we want to go to the, um, do we want to select a winner? I don't know where I am on time. Do we want to select an upcoming winner for a, um, a another special giveaway we're going to do? Any more questions? Any final questions? Paul, this has been fun, man. Yeah, I, I, you know me. I love I love talking Tableau. I you know I still love learning the product. It's in, it's evolving. It used to be pretty easy. It, we had one major release every year. We go to to conference. They'd give us all the the new tools, and and we'd walk away happy. And now it's every quarter, and um, it takes a little bit of effort to to keep up with it, but it's still a lot of fun. Um, and, and, and I just, I still love using Tableau, um, you know, any, every chance I get. Paul, is there, when it comes to the mapping and the layers and so forth, I'm curious if there are any, uh, client stories you could share generically, you know, to protect the, uh, the innocent, but, um, you know, any, have you seen, uh, some of the clients out in the wild using this and any particular types of analyses that they're, they're using it for? I mean, you've got kind I've, of a site selection a little bit. absolutely and and you know the 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 one the, the biggest one anyone that has any type of issue um or has any dealings with supply chain is absolutely critical because people want to understand um want to have a spatial knowledge of um you know where the where the bottlenecks are. If it's if 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 you have un, um, unfinished goods that have to be then transported um, to another location, if there's a bottleneck in in, in at a per, particular plant, um, mm -hmm. I'll give you something else too. Um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is is safety. Everyone has and obtains safety data. Um, and you know, centered around workers' compensation, um, and so it is. Imp it's it's really imperative that you can, if you have multiple plants across, um, a, you know, a, across the, the country, that you're able to monitor um, what what safety issues you may be having in one specific location. It might be because you're in the Northeast and it's it's colder in the Northeast. And so when it snows, people are tripping on or slipping on things. Um, um, but but that's another area, obviously in this, in this era of COVID, um, people wanna know where the outbreaks are. And I think where I've seen it most recently is, is identifying what counties um, are, 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 are having, you know, difficulties with, um, with COVID or, you know, increased COVID cases. So those are probably three right off the bat that I can mention that I've seen firsthand. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and Paul, you touched on the, the COVID analysis and that kind of speaks to one more question that we have time for here is um, Patrick is asking about how do you handle multiple shape files that cannot be related? And I, what I think about is kind of what you were talking about, the level of detail. And the reason I talk about COVID is, you know, you had COVID data from for all sorts of geographies. Some of it was zip code, some of it was county, some of it was like, you know, um, like the uh, congressional block states. Like, you know, when you've got those types of things, just real quick, I think that's what uh, what you were showing is a, is a great example of how to do that. that 
Exactly. And, and, and that's really the, the, the groundbreaking um, portion of this. There is no limit to the number of layers, map layers that you can use. Um, I have, I, you know, I now have seen hundreds, um, but I have seen, you know, upwards of, of the teams um, and, it, and it works effortlessly. And it really does allow you to bring in different levels of granularity um, based on, on location. A lot of people use um, Google Analytics, which um, makes use of MSAs, which are, you know, where the metropolitan um, statistical areas are located. And that's always been an issue. Well, I, I've got state data, I've got county data, I've got zip code data. How do I mash that up against um, MSA data, which I'm collecting from, from Google? And, and so this effortlessly puts that all those layers on a map for you. And, and uh, Paul, Patrick followed up on the question he's saying, uh, but they have to be the same data source, right? And, and I think that the answer to that is that they can be in separate shape files and it kind of, to your point, effortlessly blends them. But you tell me that. Um, yeah, if you'll, if, and if you'll notice here on my, all of these are from, um, although they're, they're either CSV files or, or um, um, text files or Excel files, these are four different data sources. Here. It's not 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 all in one, um, not located all in one area. Yeah, and if again, can you confirm that if some of those were shape files and then some of them were CSVs, they would still work the same? I think that they would. I can. I tell you what. Um, please feel free to share my. Um, um, you can reach me at plisborg at salesforce.com. And if you have, we can follow up. I can, I can, I can, um, I can take a look for you, but I believe it should work um, without any issues. Awesome. And Paul, there are a couple more questions for you in the chat, but uh, I think we're going to continue to plow forward. Really appreciate uh, this presentation and the conversation. This has been awesome. My pleasure. All right. I think I, my, um, my wife, Jen, who, who assists everyone here, asked that, um, that I also help with, um, with identifying a winner. Is that right? So I'm going to steal the thing and then we'll throw it back to you in just a second. Sure. So here's what we're going to do, peeps. Um, whether you know it or not, uh, and here I'll turn my video back on just for the funsies of the whole thing. Maybe. Yeah. What's up? So, hey, uh, Steve Wexler, friend of ATUG and the Tableau community, has written another book. Uh, and, and Bridget, by the way, who's going to be speaking next, has, is in the process or in the final stage of writing a book as well. But um, the big picture, this is a, a, a really, really interesting book. You know, the, the tagline here is how to use data visualization to make better decisions faster. And you think about, you know, what we just went through in 2020. And everybody was using data to make decisions because everything that we knew about business all went out the window really, really fast. And so um, just uh, we got a, a, a copy of this book that Steve sent us to give away to this group. Uh, Steve is going to be in town um, in July and he was hoping that we'd get together, but I think we're going to miss him by just a, a few days here. But um, yeah, he's, he's always um, fantastic about sharing his knowledge with the community, and this is such a great opportunity, too. So um, what we're going to do, Paul, I will now stop sharing and throw it back to you. Uh, and as I do that, uh, we have taken everybody that signed up, I think, as of midnight last night. So that's why you should sign up early, people, because then that you know, allows you to have an opportunity here. And Paul is going to spin the great wheel, and uh, he has proven to us that this is actually random. So there is uh, no tomfoolery happening here. Um, we've got so uh, yeah, Victor's Victor's leading the way. Oh, William Kelly, Kelly Gilbert. Ooh, here we go. What a great use of a what are these charts called, y'all? Race racing chart, right? What I think so. Wheel? Yeah. Fantastic. So using Tableau's um, um, randomization calculation, um, using some rank. Hey, Kelly. Chick is Kelly all, is Kelly with us? Whoa, good job, Kelly. <laughs> Hello, Hi, Paul. Paul. That's awesome. Kelly Pratt. All right. We, uh, we know how to find you. I will. There we go. There we go. All right. Congratulations. 
Awesome. And y'all, hey, this is why you sign up. You know, you never know what you'll get. Um, but uh, that oh. was that was a really cool biz. That was great. I love the animation. <laughs> there you go. All right, Paul, there's some questions in the uh, Q&A for you. And with that, I'm going to steal it back. Actually, I'll steal the screen. But Karen, I think you are going to introduce our next speaker. Yes. Hang on. Let me get my video again. As well. OK. All right. Yes, it is my pleasure to introduce Wait, hold Bridget. Hold on, hold on, so, hold on. I think I screwed up. Are we doing <laughs> this or are we doing this? Jen, speak to us. It Let's may be Kahoot. Kahoot time. It may be time for Kahoot in between. Time for Kahoot. Okay. Bridget, <laughs> All right, we'll Kahoot. come right back. <laughs> speak yet. <clears throat> She's like, I'm out. <clears throat> All right, so. Um, Jen uh, and I, I think, are going to be leading the Kahoot. We are rookies at this. Um, so when it all goes just south, you guys are going to have to give us some grace here in a minute. But we would love uh, to have everybody join us. Um, I'm going to start some music here in a second. That was my job. Hold on. Here we go. Uh, there we go. All right. So we've got uh, the Kahoot's firing up. You guys need to jump in uh, the game pin is 95948. Yes, I'm playing music. Seven, seven. <laughs> Audio settings. Uh, anyway, so yes, y'all rock and roll. So if you win the Kahoot, we'll be sending you a gift certificate to the Tableau store. Awesome. You guys know the drill at this point. We're making big things happen. This is a fun game among friends to see what you know and what you don't. We got some interesting questions too around getting back together and so forth. And then also, yeah, there's gonna be some fun stuff coming up here with the virtual Tableau conference in November. So we're going to start picking your brains on how you guys want to handle that. So lots of good stuff. Come on, peeps. We got a bunch of y'all in here. Let's go. Make this thing happen. I like whoever's coming in as Scarlet Vision. That is fantastic. Uh, Vision is always spelled with a Z, at least as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> I also see my favorite YouTube ninja, Taran, that keeps up with our YouTube for a tug. Love it. All right, give it about five more seconds. You guys get in there. Come on, really good job. Way to be there. Did we just decrease? Is that, that doesn't even make sense. <clears throat> All right. Jen, are you ready? I am ready. All right, let's rock and roll this party started. First question is a poll. You can select whatever you want to. If you had to choose which format of ATUG would you prefer moving forward? What do we think, peeps? Nelson's Backyard? No, not Nelson's backyard. <laughs> Nelson's driveway doesn't work for Nelson's backyard. We'll just say that. <clears throat> I think Andy Piper said we could use his backyard. Oh, perfect. Well, you have eight <laughs> acres, right? So let's go to your backyard. We do, but you all have to drive to Noonan. Mm. Hybrid is a winner. Virtual and in-person. Interesting, peeps. No Pat other. <laughs> we'll keep that in mind. Keep in mind how fast you answer. Polls don't count, but how fast you answer gains you points as well. Yeah. All right. What do you enjoy about what we're doing here? What topics would interest you for future ATUG meetings? Select as many as you want. If you're enjoying the EDM, then that's awesome. And if you're not, that's too bad. Ah, 
yeah, tips and tricks for the win. All right, here we go, Pete. This is where it gets real. Who wants to win Get something? His fingers ready. Go, Nelson. All right. In which year did Tableau first appear in Gartner's Magic Quadrant for Analytics NBI? 1998, 2011, 2014, or 2012? I think I know the answer, but I'm not playing. Get on those answers, though, people. What do we think? It was 2012. Tricky, tricky. Ooh. I would have been wrong. I thought it was 2011. So. Only seven people. All right. There we go. All right. SP Ooh. is winning right now. True or false? Tableau automatically generates lat long fields when your data set contains geographic data. There we go. Ooh, we've got some smart folks. Everybody got it right. Love it. That's one of those certification questions. Maybe that helped. You want to create a subset of your data based on a dimension set to specific conditions. Use a... What do we think, peeps? Is it a group, a filter, a set, or an LOD? And that is a length of dimension, if you will. Just kidding. Level of detail, peeps. Don't get crazy. <clears throat> All right. Set. Good job. Well done. Yet another. Ooh, good Katie pulling question. in the lead. Nicely done, Katie. Good job. All right. Question six. If you're trying, if you're trying to simplify a dimension by combining members into categories, create a... Group, set, filter, or LOD. I think this is where the interactive nature of the platform begins to really kind of take off. It is, of course, a group. Great job, crew. Well done. We got, I believe, two more big questions. So let's look for some separation. Katie, great job. Keep rocking and rolling. If you need to move, if you need to narrow down the data in your view, you need to create a. So there's a couple oh, different ways. Almost said the answer out loud. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's a couple different ways you could do this, but ultimately whatever you do is going to end up on the filter shelf. So absolutely spot on. Good job. You have a bunch of smart cookies. Ooh, Katie's <clears throat> still in the lead. I don't know, maybe we'll see. Quick on those fingers. You're ready. In Tableau version 2020.2, the interface changed slightly to replace the number of records field with. Dansby Swanson, yes. Go Dansby. <laughs> In the seventh inning or later, that man is money, people. <clears throat> <laughs> what do we He's think, Pete? A little easy on the eyes. <laughs> table name count that's right you know fun fact um you know you can actually create your own number of records by doing the sum of one i don't know if everybody knew that that's true Is brian e brian ellison and brrr, who's number one Katie. Congratulations, Katie. If all three winners on the podium will send me their email addresses, I will send you a little something. Yes, drop us in the chat, please. Okay. Man, that was fun. All right. Miss Bridget is up. Yes. Come back with us, Karen. Okay, yeah. I'm back. All right. And Nelson, I did not I think you get the, the Gartner question. question. I was really upset. <laughs> what did, I thought it was 2011. Is that I what went you 2014. Oh, well, I, I thought 2011. That, yeah, I felt confident it was in that ballpark. But 2012 was surprising to me. So real, I'll go ahead real quick and introduce Bridget. So many of you may know Bridget Cogley. She is a Tableau Zen master and consultant at Technion. I happen to know just from Bridget reading like your blog and stuff online that you got started in sign language, right? Interpreting sign language. 
So, was a certified American Sign Language interpreter for almost a decade. Yeah, so that's like a, a really cool background and I can actually see like maybe a little bit of a connection between that and data. So that I, I've always thought that was kind of a neat, fun fact. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for being with us. Maybe I'll, I'll let you share a little more about yourself if you want, but feel free to get started and you can share your screen. But thanks again for, for being here and presenting. Well, thank you for having me. So I'll definitely go ahead and share my screen because I've, I've got a little bit of the story in there as well. So that'll kind of really frame this up. So thank you very much. And I will leave my video on for now, but if you see me looking off or looking very puzzled, that's just my face, unfortunately. So Bridget Cockley, I work at Technion Data Solutions. I am a senior consultant there. I am a five-time Tableau Zen master, but I started my career in American Sign Language interpreting, kind of driving all over the place, really doing a lot of interpretation. I got in with a startup and started working out from a business side. So, I mean, I went from kind of, you know, I'm the interpreter to I was a trainer to managing folks to really starting working and reporting and, hey, we need somebody to do this. And so I, I kind of joke, I've done every job possible in a business at least once, um, including payroll. I don't recommend doing that again, but I eventually found my way into Tableau and dashboard design. And so with that, I really started to think about how I was doing the work. And so I'll kind of jump through a little bit of this. And the goal of this presentation is really to think about how to build dashboards that require less explaining, reduce the amount of rework, ideally improve usage. And that to me is how I'm defining a better dashboard. So that is kind of the, the principles here. And what this boils into is four big ideas. And the four big ideas are setting the tone, working from large to small, answering a single question, and finally moving beyond the chart. And I'll explain all these in a bit. But first I wanna kind of go to a trajectory that may or may not be familiar. And this is kind of that, you know, here's how we often start. We, we often start with kind of these dashboards and, you know, start thinking about, okay, you know, I've got, you know, my KPIs that somebody told me they needed. I've got this, you know, we want to look at sales. We want to look at profit. Um, got to have a map just because every time I've worked in biz, everyone's like, got to have the map. So we've got the map. We've also seen from Paul's presentation how useful maps can be. And then we've kind of got this profit graph. Well, we talk to our stakeholders. They say, that's great. Still need more information. So you see, I'm going to drag things on here and start adding more information. And you'll notice I'm just kind of dropping things in here right now. And this is very much the path I went through when I was early in my career, very much, okay, I need to add more charts. I need to throw these things in here and maybe I'll line that up to here because that seems like a good spot. And you'll see it's kind of thrown on all these additional legends. And this is very much you know, how I started. And from there, I kind of said, okay, well, here's containers. You learn about containers where you can start putting them into containers nicely. You can kind of distribute the charts better within the view. And then you learn about, hey, did you know you can move legends and you can float them while you're tiling? And this is a great practice. And you can start putting them closer to the things that they're related to. And then I went on this journey of make it pretty, you know, and uh, this is something I hear, you hear, I'm sure a lot of folks here, if we got to make this a pretty dashboard. So here's the pretty dashboard. I, I've picked better colors. I've made it really pretty. I've got lots of pretty colors on here. You know, I, I've got my dual axis color coded. And this was very much the path I went on as I was learning Tableau. And it was like, okay, great. I, I got to this point. But it's still just, it wasn't working with me. It wasn't resonating. And I was really struggling with, well, what's the next level? How do I, you know, I've done all the things. I've figured out, you know, the right charts, but now what? And so I went on this long journey several years ago now and looked at who does this well. And I mean, this is back in 2015. And I was looking around and stumbled upon this great visionary, Kelly Martin. And if you don't know her name, you absolutely should. Vizcandy.blogspot.com. You should go read the whole blog. But she does wonderful work. And so I really looked at kind of what did she do? Like, how did the mechanics of all this work? Why does it look the way it did? And I went on this long discovery and talk about, you know, pulling in a background of American Sign Language, really went back to some of my earlier work of what is language and, you know, looking at Baker Schenck and Coakley's definition of what a language is. And I'm like, hey, there's a lot of overlap here. 
And I kind of had this epiphany in 2016. So Andy Cotgreave kind of redid this other dashboard tableau put out. The whole idea is, hey, you can make this really quick, simple, beautiful dashboard. And I was like, okay. And he, he put out a question to the community of, well, what would you do differently? And so I took it back and I played. And that really was kind of an awakening for me. That whole talk and discussion is documented out there. It's under Data Visualization Linguistics. It's on my blog. It's on TC's, um, TC16's talk track. And then if you really want to, you can certainly buy the book. More on that coming soon. So that was kind of the, the journey of figuring out, okay, here's you know how to build the room and kind of, kind of talking to people. And one of the things I stumbled upon, and I, I'm testing this because I, I do think there's a potential of where coronavirus has actually maybe pivoted this. And so I'm going to ask for your participation. Feel free to put it in the chat. Feel free to kind of document this, but I want you to think about, I'm gonna show you a room here in a second. I'm even going to pause talking and let you really look at this room and think about how you would describe it to someone else who's not looking at it. And so I'll jump to that room. Feel free to put this in the chat. You are contributing to my data collection. And then if any of the organizers want to maybe jump in and start reading some of the things they're saying, I unfortunately cannot get to the chat very easily. Sure, I will. Um, okay, we're seeing modern conference room, open, spacious, tranquil, bright, natural, beautiful table, um, consistent coloring between the decorations, modern, rustic, view of the city, nice view, cityscape, office meeting room, inviting large windows, letting in lots of light. Perfect. So I'll go ahead and kind of jump to, you know, I want to think about as you started describing this room, where did you start? And I just, I'll hold that out there for a second. When you think about we're describing this room, what was one of the first things you told somebody? And again, feel free to throw this in the chat. And then if somebody can kind of read off what we're seeing real quickly. It and what I, oh, sorry. People are saying the overall feel. Perfect. OK. And so one of the things when I've given this live, and again, this is where I feel like coronavirus has potentially ruined my data set. So I may have to do this test somewhere else. But typically, when I've had people describe the room, they start with the table, they go to the window, sometimes they'll start with the lights, you know, but typically people pick an anchor and it's really scattered. But what very few people typically tell me, and again, this is pre-virus when I was doing this live, is that most people were not telling me that this is a conference room. Now, since I've been delivering this um, talk since the virus, I am getting a lot more conference room and I'm getting a lot more of those kind of adverbs and kind of explanations of, you know, more of the feel of it rather than kind of, you know, oh, there's a table, there's this, there's this. Um, language also affects the answer in American Sign Language. I actually have to tell you first, it's a conference room and then I work my way around the room. So there is definitely a language bias to this as well, but I'm going to have to test my theory on this. But this builds up to the idea of kind of the four big ideas. So the idea that we set the tone. So we're saying, hey, this is a conference room. We're working large to small. So that might be we're starting with the table. We're starting with the window. We're, we're starting with the largest things. And we're ultimately answering the single question of what is this room? From there, we get into kind of this harder part, which is the idea of beyond the chart. It's not that one thing in there told you it was a conference room. It was the collection of all the items that work together to tell you this is a conference room. So the table, the chairs, kind of that whole beyond the chart idea. So we'll really jump into this and start thinking about kind of these principles and context. When we look at setting the tone, we're really thinking about the look, the feel, the flow, and the context. That's a lot of the information that you were starting to provide me as we were looking at that room. You're starting to say this aesthetic, you know, it's really clean, it's modern, it's, there's a rustic component to it. And we were really getting a sense of place 
from that room. And so we can do this with our dashboards as well. So this is actually that same analysis. You can see that I pulled the KPIs up to the top. You can see I've got that profit by category. I've got my map here. I'm actually going to go ahead and be a little evil and cheat and kind of spread this out a bit more. But the final piece I'm going to pull back in is some of the sales piece. And so I got to make sure I've got the right one. I'll pull this back in. You'll notice I've quieted the colors quite a bit, but there's a hidden secret to this dashboard. And I'm not going to leave it out for very long, but I'm going to kind of pull this out, see if you notice that there is a small illusion in here that I don't overtly state because I'm going to take this legend out. We don't need it. And the reason we don't need it is because I've got enough clarity, I feel, to leave it out. And so we'll kind of work through this. One of the other things that I don't know about you, I personally really struggle with a lot of these legends and I don't like them either. And so I'm gonna take this out and I'm going to add something else. And so part of what I'm going to do is start pulling in additional detail to help the users really begin to navigate what I want them to understand. And so you'll see I've pulled this in. I am going to Julia Child this a little bit, skip over to my prepared oven so I've made this dish and we'll kind of look at, you know, if I play with this, play with the spacing and the organization of this dashboard a bit, you can see now I've got this, I've taken into account interaction. And so I've got additional detail that we can see technology is definitely outpacing furniture, but that I can start hovering over this and getting that additional detail and really seeing that data in a lot better way than the legend can provide. And because I've got profit by category, I'm actually combining these two. I'm letting them work as a single chart, even though they're two different charts. So that's kind of that, you know, setting the tone. The other hidden secret, all my sales is blue, my profit is green, and you can see profit here, profit here, they're all in a family of green. So I'm really trying to make it explicit that, hey, anything sales is going to be blue, anything profit is going to be green. I've also given you subtle clues of if you take your mouse and you say, okay, well, I wanna look at maybe this time period, you can start filtering the data using set actions and very quickly get to more information. So that's kind of another way of building it in. You can see where I've got these kind of items that called out forward. And then some of these other items, I've let them fall back so that you know, here's the pattern, but I went ahead and dropped it out through set actions. And again, you can very quickly say, well, I want the whole thing and pull everything back in. So these are some types of functionalities that you can also use. When we get to building large to small, this is very much like an English writing assignment. You think about what is the main idea, you put in supports, and then lastly, you get into details. I also personally call this faceting. It comes from interpreting, just really taking a thing and looking at it from all angles and really explaining it so people understand it. And so we'll kind of start looking at that as well. And so this is my home temperature data. So we are total nerds. We have got sensors all throughout the house. And we did this experiment to understand, you know, where are the warmest areas of the house? Again, we're up north, particularly when we did this data tracking, it was winter. So warmer is better than colder. Um, again, I, I know that, you know, again, so warmer is better than colder in this instance. And so this might be kind of a view we would build for ourselves. We might say, oh, I wanna look at it by this. I wanna look at it by this and start seeing using small multiples if we can get a sense of the pattern. When we start translating this to dashboards for our users though, this type of view doesn't work. And so what we'll wanna do is start kind of thinking that large to small idea. So the high level is, hey, my bedroom during the winter when it's super cold is 70 degrees and that's a place I want to be versus my art room where I'm actually taking this call right now is 65 degrees and super, super cold. So my phalanges are frozen and not working very well. And then I want to look at this by day so I can kind of see, you know, the variance in temperatures. You can actually get a sense of when we place the sensor versus, you know, when we may have picked it up and checked it again. And then from there, each individual day, I can start getting a sense of those readings by day. And you can see again, a lot of hidden that interactivity. You can see where I'm gonna use my legend and kind of work across the room, if you will, by using highlighting functions and just say, okay, here's you know all this color. They work together as multiple pieces, but you can see I'm working from a very high level detail. What are the rooms? 
what are the days, what's the time of day, to the each individual microsecond reading. So these are actual readings, you know, at, over a course of time. And so you can really get a sense of what's going on. And so that's kind of that high to low. The single question is probably the best covered domain when you watch a lot of Tableau's training videos and things like that, they really focus in on how do you build better data viz. And the first thing I feel like everybody gets taught is the idea of answer a single question. It's instead of trying to tackle the world and make a dashboard that answers everything, let's really, really focus in so that short answer, then you expand, but then you also provide detail into what's next. And what that does is it accumulates up to clarity. We start getting a better sense of what this dashboard is. So I'm going to jump to kind of this mobile dashboard. And so you can see here standard kind of KPI numbers. They also get called bands. Um, but really looking at, you know, here's items, products, how many days to ship, and what kind of discount comes into play. So you already kind of start to know what I'm thinking about. And part of what I'm thinking about is shipping. I'm looking at transit time. So here's kind of that overall transit time. I've got mode. We've got press to highlight. And then we get into those individual orders that we can start kind of saying, well, what happened here? What happened here? Now, before I click the button, I do want to highlight that this was designed with mobile in mind. And so a part of what I've done is made it so that from a default, it automatically converts this to mobile. So you can see that this is using the automatic designer. And we can very quickly and easily kind of see how this dashboard will perform on a mobile standpoint, particularly thinking I'm going to use my finger. I'm going to, when I start interacting with this, I wanna make sure that the points are easy for me to grasp. And so as we get here, one of the other things I wanna avoid is, oh, I forgot what I was thinking about. And so rather than filtering, the actions actually pull out into a set and allow you to do a comparison. So here's everything else. Here's the particular thing I'm focused on. And so I can really start to understand the impacts of the shipping mode and see where things fall so that when I've got, you know, first class orders and maybe they're taking too long, I can really get a sense of what's going on. So, you know, they're paying first class, it took three days. I really need to look at that. Whereas I've got some of these others that were not first class, but went faster. And so these are things I'll probably explore. So that is kind of that idea. Now, the real fun of this is that idea of moving beyond the chart. And I, I definitely feel like, and I really feel I was taught this way. It was very much, you start that tiled layout, you drag things and each individual chart is its own thing. Um, I've worked with a lot of that bento box paradigm. I'm actually featuring it a fair bit in my book of, you know, here's these templates, this thing goes in this spot, this thing goes in that spot. Everything has a nice tidy spot. They're all very clean and separated. When we start thinking beyond the chart, we're looking at exploring, we're looking at building, and we're looking at refining, but ultimately the goal is integration. We're really trying to make pieces that work together. And so here's kind of a start of that idea. And so you can see I've kind of thrown some ideas here. And so as we start looking at this type of dashboard, you know, we may talk to folks and they say, well, we definitely want, you know, trend over time. And then we also want some trending data down here. And so, you know, one way we may build is we may put the things here. We may start thinking, okay, we'll put the sales piece here. For whatever reason, I'm working with a company and they've got a really big logo and we've got to have the header super huge. And that's unfortunate. And so what I may do, because I've got certain barriers that say, well, this must be so large, I'm going to start moving beyond kind of some of the literal chart and a lot of the literal training and I'm going to break some walls. I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to take this header. I'm going to put this super fancy chart in here. I'll kind of call this out and let it be different. And then within this, I've got kind of these area charts. I've got, you know, this legend. I really don't want a legend on this composition. I don't feel like I need one. <laughs> you'll, you'll notice a little bit of anti-legend sentiment. Um, and then I'll start consolidating. But here's an opportunity. Part of what I'm doing with this is really showing kind of ratios and percentages. And so what I may do is start breaking some of the lines again. And my goal here is really to make this feel like a cohesive piece, to really let people get lost into a bit of what I'm telling them. And so I may start really blurring the lines here and make each of these pieces work together. And so again, I'm going to go ahead and do the Julia Child moment. I'm going to jump to the finished chicken. And this is our chicken dinner. 
And so when I sit here and play with spacing and work with everything and make it all work together, you can see that this is the final piece that, you know, I've really kind of taken and blurred the lines between what is a chart. And that's kind of my goal with a lot of this work is really going beyond the everything must be in its own strict confines. How can I make the charts make them actually easier to work together? How can I help the users understand all of these things are related and get a better sense together of what the relationships are? So I'll kind of jump back to this mobile piece again. And you'll see here, one of the things I've done is I've put in little chart art, really. I've got these little dots. I've just added a little bit more barriers. And then within the phone layout, what I've also done is I've taken into account people are going to be using this, people are going to be scrolling. And so one thing I want to do is give them crash landing zones. <laughs> so again, this is that bit of thinking beyond the chart. You can see where I've said, OK, here's where, you know, axes are, there's some white space. Let me make it so that when somebody is using their finger, they have a safe place to land. I'm also putting in crash barriers here as well. So that way my users aren't going off the cliff. They can very easily scroll without accidentally going, oh, I'm scrolling and now I've clicked on second class, which is not what I wanted. You can tell I have a lot of phone problems. And so with that, I, I want to kind of jump to some experiments I did around these ideas. So really thinking through, you know, I watch a lot of these futuristic movies. So you think like Tron and Guardians of the Galaxy. And every time you watch these movies, they always have these dashboards on like these smoky glass displays. And it's like, you know, what actually makes a futuristic dashboard? And so I had to kind of play with this. I, I put this in homage of Marauder and I felt like every time I looked at the pattern between, OK, these are futuristic dashboards, they're these really dense, really abstract creations. And they always have circles. They always seem to stem from the middle and then branch out. And so I was like, OK, we're going to play. And so what you've got here is kind of, you know, you've got to have the standard donut chart. You've got and then I've got this secondary donut chart and it all kind of coalesced together and just really kind of breaking the lines and playing with the barriers. You'll see that, you know, kind of with my population pyramid, you know, I had a lot of empty space. And so I was like, OK, we're really going to fill and break lines and have everything kind of just be together. And so that gives you an idea. And secretly, there's a lot of color on this. There is a lot of ugly colors. This is not a pretty yellow, but on this piece, it works really, really well. And one of the questions I've gotten is, well, does it have to be dark to be futuristic? And I'll really, I'll kind of turn that back to you and kind of ask what people here think. So I'm going to go ahead and throw up images of these so you can really see them side by side. And I'm just curious, when you look at these, does one feel more futuristic to you? <laughs> and then I've also had, well, does it have to be so abstract? And I'll kind of jump in and show, here's kind of a, a lesser abstracted version. I mean, it's still very kind of quasi normal, but you know, we've got more of a standard line kind of chart or a bar chart there. We've got a little bit more standard display of data. And I mean, we're still kind of crossing some lines, but you can see where we've containerized it. We still have this on top of that. Um, so you've still kind of got that high level view going into that detailed view and they're still together. And this in particular was one of those areas that on the white in particular, that area got way too noisy. And so you'll notice that in the white, I really had to kick that one down because there was a lot going on. It felt very chaotic. And so this had to be more quiet for it to be on this lighter dashboard. And so that to me was really kind of the, the kicker of all of this is just really playing with what makes a concept, a concept, what really sets that tone. And then you can see where all the rules kind of come into play, looking at over time, looking at some feedback, looking at kind of demographics. So it, it really adheres to those rules, even though it's a very abstract creation. And so I'll move this one more time. And so with that, I am going to wrap up, but that's kind of these big ideas of setting the tone, working large to small, answering that single question, and then finally challenging everybody here to think beyond the chart, that it doesn't all have to be tidy. It can be a little bit messy and integrated. 
And so with that, I will open it up to questions. So Bridget, as the questions are coming in, um, first off, this is really cool. Uh, like you got so many different things, like the way that we process things visually. Uh, I love the way that you brought that to life and then kind of brought it into Tableau land. Um, so just like, first off, that's just super cool stuff. Um, so great start there. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And then y'all, if you have questions for Bridget, you know, I'll say this, um, we had uh, folks on both sides of the fence when it came to the futuristic. Um, there were some folks who kind of felt like they both looked futuristic. Um, you know, when uh, Julian said uh, they both look futuristic, but the black looks more digital and the white looks more luxurious. So I love like the, um, the adjectives uh, and the description there. Um, you know, for me, it, you know, I think it's trendy in our world as, as you spoke to, to like kind of bring things into the dark um, and have that dark background and kind of be like, well, this is edgy uh, because it's dark. Um, but it's, you know, I love the way you presented the two next to each other and so forth. Um, so really, really cool stuff. Uh, Karen, I think you're still on with us. Um, any questions that you're seeing or anything, uh, else that you would like to call out and I think you're with us if you're not no um, I, I'm still here I'm still here yeah I have to drop in just a minute so sorry for another meeting but no, no I'm looking through the chat I don't see a lot of questions but yeah a lot of comments on like the different designs and which one is you know which one and if someone also mentioned that iron viz winners seem to have dark backgrounds which is interesting yeah I was going to call that out too because I think um, not just Iron Viz, but it would also be fun to go pull up all, you know, visit the day and visit the week for the last, you know, few weeks and kind of look at kind of the light versus the dark. And again, it's like, I feel like the graphic designers tend to the dark or at least to use a, a color in the background in order to make things pop. Um, and I think my hesitation in business dashboards is like, is anybody going to print this? Because we're going to make them mm -hmm. miserable. Exactly. Print, right. So. Uh, one one question um any ideas for how to change the traditional mindset and work toward more integration so a lot of it really when i am dealing with companies is i call it bad behavior and so a lot of times i i get a lot of clients and you know they have in mind we're going to build this thing and so sometimes i'll build them exactly what they want but you know i always push them to the iphone example and that is you know way back when and i'm going to date myself i had a blackberry and i lived and died by the blackberry there was brick breaker there was you know little trackpad and if you would have asked me then how do i make that blackberry better i would have said well i need the keyboard to do this i need you know the trackpad to do this and what happened is at some point apple said that's great i'm going to put the keyboard in the screen and we all have phones like this now, I mean, except for probably the rare few, but broadly, we've all moved towards the screen is on the phone. And what that allows us to do is when we don't need the keyboard, it's not there. And so to me, what I typically do is I kind of take that same approach of I can make you a Blackberry and I can work to make this Blackberry better. Or if you let me, I will give you an iPhone and I can really change the paradigm. And so that's where that bad behavior comes in, where sometimes I'll do two cuts of a thing where here is your, you know, here's my extreme version. Um, but then let me back it out into something more acceptable to you as well. And then we'll kind of iterate between there because I find it's death by baby steps and you never get there. It's I want to learn how to play Mozart, but I'm going to start only with Mary Had a Little Lamb. And I'm only going to listen to Mary Had a Little Lamb. And don't you dare play that sonata to me. And so that would be my advice is that. And then there is also a wonderful book by Chip and Dan Heath called Switch. And I read that very early in my career. And it's one of those books where you learn how to motivate people. I learned that for my organization when at the time, the best way to motivate somebody was rage. So it was very much motivating that elephant. And so I spent a lot of time before talking to them, shaping the path. And then I really went in, got them hopped up and angry, hit them in the rear with a pen and sent them running down the path I had molded. That'll do it. 
<laughs> well, and, you know, your, your, your discussion on the iPhone uh, takes me back to Henry Ford famously said, you know, if I had asked my customer what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Um, and so, you know, it does sometimes take a visionary to give people the next generation. And I think that you're, you're wise in trying to push people that way. Um, Bridget, this has been fantastic. Really grateful for you. And, um, you, if you guys want to check out more, Bridget's got an amazing Tableau public resume, uh, portfolio, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so much good stuff there. Bridget, anything you want to point out to people? It looks like oh. you're making this downloadable. This is downloadable. And the other thing is I strongly encourage people download it, play with it and see what you would do differently. Because one of the things you'll notice throughout a lot of my work is I've played with a lot of experimentation. I spent probably more time than one human should remaking a dashboard. And that is all the talk over here is. It is purely just how many different ways can I remake the same dashboard as an intentionality exercise to think differently. And ultimately these experiments are going into the book that's coming out. I love it. That's awesome. Bridget, thanks so much. We'll definitely want to have you back when the book comes out and let you teach us some more uh, in the future. Thank you. It's been fantastic. Awesome. All right. I am going to steal the screen one more time and bring us home. Don't leave yet, people. We need your help. Uh, and by we, I mean the University of Georgia, uh, the Terry College of Business. I know there are probably a handful of you um, who are either UGA graduates or uh, particularly graduates of the Terry College. Um, but what is what we're looking for here is they're looking for somebody who can come in and do a handful of presentations, um, either at UGA uh, or remotely via Zoom. Um, this would be during the fall semester. So you're looking at kind of September to mid-November. Um, and you're looking at uh, a commitment of two or three presentations, each to be an hour long, kind of in the space around Tableau and uh, analysis of large data sets. So um, if that's you and you'd like to give some of your time uh, to a worthy uh, cause and opportunity, I uh, definitely would encourage you guys to do that. Um, and uh, Jen's already put it in the chat, but we'll also send out um, the, the contact information for both Frederick and Matthew. Um, they'd love to hear from you and uh, anybody who's interested there. This is for the Society of Business Intelligence. And they have a slick logo. That thing's awesome. Um, so super pumped there. Um, love to have uh, ATUG continue to contribute to um, the community in, in big ways. And I think with that, we're going to say, uh, you know, thank you, feedback, suggestions. You know, we're I think everybody remembers, or at least those of you who've been around for nearly a year and a half, uh, we, we pivoted pretty rapidly from massive in-person events. Uh, like one of the last in-persons that we did was that, um, you know, big blow the doors off 10 year uh, celebration that we had at Comcast. Um, and then we pivoted rapidly to going virtual. And now as things begin to reopen, we will be interested to see how it all kind of comes back together. You know, one of the questions we get a lot is like, hey, when's ATO going to be in person again? And I'll politely remind everybody that that requires uh, an organization in the city uh, of Atlanta to open their doors to, you know, 100 plus people uh, who are not employees of the organization. So uh, just as soon as we have a volunteer uh, organization that wants to do that, and we have some green lights from Tableau, Salesforce, so forth, um, that would be when we would start the conversation of going back to in-person, but uh, it's complicated is, is really the best thing. So um, any thoughts there? Uh, if you want to open up your own doors, future topics, presentations, ideas, suggestions, feedbacks on virtual meetings, how can we make these better? Man, oh man, so much good stuff. Uh, this has been a fun one for us today. Um, so on behalf of Jen, Anna, Karen, uh, Turan, Nathan, um, you know, Alyssa, Jordan, Rasta, uh, and the whole crew. Uh, thank y'all so much. And again, a big thanks to both Bridget and to Paul for sharing their gifts and talents with us this afternoon. You all can find us uh, on um, Slack, hit us up on Twitter, shoot us an email. We're here for you uh, and anything else we can do to be helpful to you. So with that, we'll give you two minutes back. Really appreciate you being here and uh, look forward to seeing everybody in July, I believe on the 15th uh, for some great presentations. So y'all be good. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. And Iron Viz Entry is getting done. Make it happen.